probably the least surprising thing you could ever tell me is when Greg Crower Hartman made this post, it was going to become a big deal. Rust is not a silver bullet that can solve all security problems, but it sure helps out a lot and will cut out huge swatches of the Linux kernel vulnerabilities as it gets used more widely in our code base. That being said, we just assigned our first CVE for some Rust code in the kernel, and we'll have a look at that in just a moment, where the offending issue just caused a crash, not the ability to take advantage of the memory corruption, a much better thing overall. Especially considering it's a few days after this, new Linux patch confirms, Rust experiment is done, Rust is here to stay. I am not surprised, even in the slightest, that there are people that saw this CVE and made a big deal about it because they didn't know what the CVE actually was and what caused the problem and why it actually isn't that big of a deal and also what a kernel CVE actually is and why a kernel CVE is not anywhere near remotely the same as something like a CVE in React or a CVE in, I don't know, Photoshop or something else like that. But before we get to that, did you know I have a podcast? I post about it every week and apparently people don't. You can find it at Tech Over T. We've had on KDE devs, multiple KDE devs. We've had Linux YouTubers, game developers, VTubers, even the founder of Stop Killing Games. So, come and check it out. That is Tech Over T on YouTube. You can find it on basically every podcast platform. And now back to the regular video. Here is the CV report in question. In the Linux kernel, the following vulnerability has been resolved. Rust binder fixed race condition on death list. If binder sounds familiar, there is a good reason for that. As you may recall, this is part of Google's Android stack that I don't really know why is upstreamed into the main kernel because Android is basically the only consumer of binder. It's basically the IPC, the inter-process communication system used on Android. Technically, it's not actually Google tech, but Google at this point are the only ones who actually use it. So others could use it. So I guess it kind of does make sense to be in the kernel. I don't know. It's a weird situation where most people aren't even remotely interacting with it but it has been upstreamed. Why it's in the kernel isn't really that important, it is, and there was a problem with it. Rust binder contains the following unsafe operation. Safety. A node death is never inserted into the death list of any other node other than its owner, so it is either in this death list or in no death list. And then there is this very short unsafe operation, node underscore inner dot death underscore list dot remove self. So it is removing itself from the list. This operation is unsafe because when touching the previous and next pointers of a list element, we have to ensure that no other thread is also touching them in parallel. If the node is present in the list that remove is called on, then that is fine because we have exclusive access to that list. If the node is not in any list, then it's also okay. But if it's present in a different list that may have accessed in parallel, then that may be a data race on the previous and next pointers. This is basically the textbook definition of a threading bug. This is, like, you would have this as an example of what not to do, what to avoid when dealing with multiple threads. Basically, what it is saying is if we just have this one list here, no problem whatsoever. If we have this node over here that is not in a list, no problem whatsoever. If, however, we have two lists and a separate thread is accessing each of them, if we go and remove this node here, if we are pointing to here on the other thread, and then we call previous, so we go and say, I want this node here, this node has already been deleted. So if we go and try to call delete on an already deleted node, well, 
everything is gone. We're going to crash the application. Now, there are a few things we need to talk about because every time Unsafe comes up with Rust, there are discussions about how this proves that Rust is bad and you should never use Rust and Rust doesn't solve any problems. There are some legitimate discussions to be had about how Unsafe probably shouldn't be used in most cases. There are obviously contexts where it does make sense, and that involves systems programming and some very other specific things, but in most cases, you do not need to use unsafe. But the thing about unsafe is when you use it, you are specifically documenting its usage. When you are writing C code, every line of that is unsafe. That's just the state of C. That doesn't mean it's bad, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But when you are accessing these powers with Rust, you are specifically documenting their usage. But what powers does Unsafe actually give you? Because it doesn't let you do absolutely everything. It does not disable the borrow checker. So as per the Rust documentation on Unsafe Rust, we have five specific powers. Firstly, dereference a raw pointer. You are then allowed to ignore the borrowing rules by having both immutable and mutable pointers or multiple pointers to the same location. Aren't guaranteed to point to valid memory, are allowed to be null, and don't implement any automatic cleanup. So basically, when you are dealing with a raw pointer in Rust, you have to treat it like you are treating a pointer in C and not do things like point to the same memory block and then remove that memory and then suddenly crash your application or not have a null and then just try to do something with the null. You know, if you've ever written any code that lets you access pointers, you probably have some understanding of the bad things you can do with a pointer. Again, pointers are not the problem. But you have to be careful when you are dealing with a raw pointer because it does let you do some stupid things if you are not paying attention to the way you are handling them. Secondly, call an unsafe function or method. So if you've defined a function as unsafe, this can only be called from another unsafe block. Access or modify a mutable static variable. Statics are what Rust calls a global. Implement an unsafe trait. So if you define a trait as unsafe, the only way to implement that is also making the rest of the block unsafe. A trait in Rust is what other languages would call an interface. And finally, access the fields of unions. A union is similar to a struct, but only one declared field is used in a particular instance at one time. Unions are primarily used to interface with unions in C code. Accessing union fields is unsafe because Rust can't guarantee the type of data being stored in the union instance. Again, these powers can only be used in an unsafe block. So when you are using them, when you are using unsafe, you need to specifically keep all of these things in mind. And you are specifically documenting their usage in that section of the code. The use of unsafe is not inherently bad, is not inherently dangerous. But like when you are writing C code, you do have to be careful with how you are handling memory. When you are not writing unsafe code, these powers cannot be used, and these things are not a concern. Now, there might be other logic concerns, but these specific things cannot be used. With that out of the way, we also need to discuss what a Linux kernel CVE actually is. Because CVE, whilst it is the same numbering system, doesn't necessarily mean the same kind of issue that you'd expect to see from, you know, a lot of other projects. It doesn't actually mean a security issue when we are talking about the kernel. So the kernel became their own CNA, a CVE numbering authority, the organization that assigns CVEs to any of the problems they might have. And they documented the process of how they assign CVEs and what they assign CVEs to. 
The important part is this one right here. Note, due to the layer in which the Linux kernel is in a system, almost any bug might be exploitable to compromise the security of the kernel, but the possibility of exploitation is often not evident when the bug is fixed. Because of this, the CVE assignment team is overly cautious and assigns CVE numbers to any bug fix that they identify. This explains the seemingly large number of CVEs that are issued by the Linux kernel team. So in this case, there wasn't anything to actually exploit. What happened is when the node was accessed in a way that was illegal, the application just crashed because that's what Rust is going to do when you do an illegal memory operation. Now, this right here, this point, is why it seems like the kernel has suddenly just become vastly less secure. In 2023, they had 290 CVEs. In 2024, when they became their own CNA, they had 3,500. That's not because the kernel suddenly had a drop in code quality. It's because now basically every single bug, anything that might crash the kernel alongside the security issues, are now given a CVE. Even if it's a very minor thing that requires physical access to do and requires 30 different things all at once to happen, even that is going to be given a CVE if it can crash the kernel. Because if the kernel crashes the entire system crashes. So effectively, any crash is a denial of service. I don't necessarily agree with this stance, but it is the way they are handling it. And because this is something people often get confused about, Greg Crowell Hartman has actually done a talk, he's done multiple talks, speaking on this particular thing. Linux kernel CVEs, what has caused so many to suddenly show up? I'll leave this link down below, it is a great talk. There has also been some discussion about the rate of CVEs. How many CVEs per lines of code? And that's how we get graphs like this one, where it normalizes the number of CVEs per million lines of code. Now again, this is not... <laughs> I, I, I assume this is satire because it's so stupid. <laughs> you can't just go and take one CVE and then extrapolate it out to the entire code base. That's not how that works. Because another just as useless way to frame it is we've spent five years putting Rust code into the kernel and there's been one Rust CVE. And I didn't read this part earlier, but the same day as that Rust CVE were 159 CVEs in the C code. Yes. And also that does include my post, this was a joke. It's been about five years of Rust being in the kernel and only one CVE. 2024, there were 3,500 CVEs in the C code. By this logic, we should rewrite the entire kernel into Rust. And people took this seriously. And it's so... It's so... No, you can't just extrapolate out one CVE. The point of this is that it was stupid and a joke and people don't have the ability to understand humor. Over time, we are gonna see more CVEs pop up in the Rust code. As more code gets added, as more changes get done, obviously there are gonna be issues that happen. But you're gonna notice that there's gonna be something consistent about these problems. I am almost certain that most of them are going to be with unsafe code. Again, that doesn't mean that unsafe is bad. But it does mean that the safe code is ironing out some issues that otherwise developers would likely leave in the code. I know that over time, Rust is going to become normalized. It's going to become like System D, where, yeah, there's some people that still kind of talk about it, but no one actually cares. But until that happens... I'm going to be here all along the way because it's going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun. So let me know your thoughts down below. I, <laughs> man, man, this whole, this whole like pretending that a programming language is actually important thing. I love it. It's, it's such, it's such a good trend. Anyway. 
you liked the video, yeah, like the video, go subscribe as well if you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here. Check out the Patreon, subscribe, Deli Bearer Pay, linked in the description down below. That's going to be it for me, and when's the next one?